Hello, my name is David Willis. Welcome to my YouTube channel. Today I will be reviewing the Takamar Super Multi-Coated Lens. Uh, there are a lot of lenses out there with the name Takamar on them. And the one I happen to get my hands on is the 55mm f1.8. When I got these lenses, a friend of mine who has been collecting vintage glass longer than I have helped me sort through them. According to him, the ones that say super multi-coated, the Takamar ones that say super multi-coated, are considered better than the ones that don't because they have a coating on them that is supposed to reduce reflections and flare. Uh, near the end of the brand's lifetime, they abbreviated super multi-coated to SMC. I'm told that the coating isn't as good on those, uh, but I've not actually compared them yet. Uh, when abbreviating S-M-C refers to super multi-coated variety and SMC without the dashes is the later variety. Before we get into the specifics of this lens, here's a bit of a history lesson. Takamar lenses were manufactured by Ashahai Optical. Ashahai Optical was founded in 1919 in a shop in a suburb of Japan where they originally made lenses for glasses. In 1938, it changed its name to Ashahai Optical Company Limited and sometime around then started manufacturing camera lenses. The company was disbanded by the occupation after World War II, but was allowed to reform in 1948, at which point they started making binoculars and consumer camera lenses for two other Japanese companies, which later became Konica and Minolta. In 1952, Ashihai introduced the Ashiflex, which was the first Japanese SLR 35mm camera. Ashihai acquired the trademark Pentax in 1958 from the East German Zeiss Icon Company. It distributed photographic equipment under the name Ashahai Pentax and was exported to the U.S. by Honeywell as Honeywell Pentax for a while. In 2002, the company was renamed to the Pentax Corporation. In 2007, they were bought out by Hoya. In 2011, Hoya sold off the camera business to Ricoh, who renamed it to Pentax Ricoh Image Company Limited. Takamar was the name of the lenses that Ashahai Optical made for its Ashiflux camera. They are named for the Japanese-American portrait painter Takama Kawara, whose brother Kumano Kawara founded Ashihai Optical. I probably slaughtered those names. Ashihai Optical used the name Takamar until 1975, when Ashihai switched from the M42 screw mount to the K-mount typically associated with Pentax cameras. So any lens with the name Takamar was probably made sometime between 1952 and 1975. Pentax resurrected the name Takamar in the 1980s and 1990 for a budget line of zoom and prime lenses. These lack the super multi-coating that reduces reflections and lens flare. As a result, these lenses are less desirable. These are marked Takamar bayonet in parentheses, or Takamar-F to distinguish them from the older M42 screw mount versions. In researching these lenses, I found that the 55mm f1.8, like I have, sells on eBay for $50 to $60. The 50mm f1.4 sells for about twice, as that, twice that much. I also have a Takamar 28-80 to f3.5 to 4.5 that goes on eBay for about $14. But that's one of the bayonet mount ones that isn't as good. It doesn't have the coating. Now let's get into the physical characteristics of this lens. This lens has an M42 screw mount, which hopefully this is focusing up here. I used a newer M42 to E-mount adapter, which is about $12 on Amazon, to mount it to my Sony A7 II. If I can screw this on here. Like that. An important feature to look for in an M42 mounting adapter is this little set screw right here. Without this, I have found that a lot of the adapters, when you screw the, the lens into them, the point at which it stops, all of the, the numbers and markings and everything that you want to see for your focus, your f-stop and everything, will be on the bottom. This allows you to, to adjust a ring on here so that the entire thing can be rotated and then set. So keep that in mind when buying an M42 mount. 
the aperture goes from f1.8 to f16 in half stop clicky increments. You can hear that there. Except for the interval from f11 to f16, which only has one click. The iris has six blades. I don't know if we can see that in the camera. Probably not. Oh, there is an auto manual switch. In the manual setting, the aperture behaves normally. In the auto setting, a pin between the lens and the camera body would allow the camera to override the aperture setting to wide open to allow enough light into focus. However, the M42 adapter I have always depresses the pin, which defeats the purpose of the switch. There are M42 adapters out there that have a button on the side to allow you to make use of this, but they cost more. The lens weighs in at 72 ounces or 204 grams, uh, making it one of the lightest lenses that I have, even though it's all glass and metal. And that's, that's the weight without the adapter. The lens accepts standard screw mount filters on the front, but that it doesn't say what size they are. Uh, it appears to be 48 millimeter, but I don't have any 48 millimeter filters to try on it. The focus ring is nice and smooth and goes for about three quarters of a turn, which makes it easier to fine tune the focus than on some other lenses. Now to the performance of this lens. This is a manual focus lens, so it takes some practice to focus well. With a focus ring that goes about 270 degrees, it's easier to tune than some lenses that only have about a quarter of a turn on the focus ring. Here is a focus chart that I used. I printed out five of these on the highest quality printer that Staples had available to them and glued them to a piece of poster board and taped it to a movable wall in my studio. It's not pretty, but it also didn't cost hundreds of dollars. You may notice a bit of vignetting, but that's my lighting. I positioned one softbox above and to the left of my camera so that the corner is a bit brighter and the lower right corner is a bit darker. Here is the center of the chart at a 200% zoom. Notice the lines that are nice and crisp up to about the 6.3 mark where they start to run together. And even wide open, there is not a lot of chromatic aberration. Here is the upper left corner of the chart at f1.8. Contrast is not as good as the center, but still not a lot of chromatic aberration, even at f1.8. Here is the center at f8. Oddly enough, there's some color fringing here that did not appear at f1.8. It does seem crisper, but that may be because F8 is more forgiving of an aperture and easier to nail focus on. The corners are also a bit sharper, but still less contrast than the middle of the frame. Now let's talk about distortion. Here's a distortion chart. This is a two foot by three foot dry erase vinyl mat with one inch grid printed on it designed for playing D&D or other role playing games. You can get something like this on Amazon for about $25. The red lines were added in using Photoshop and show what a true straight line would be. There appears to be a bit of barrel distortion, but not very much. And lastly, here are some sample images that I took with this lens. Here's a picture of some white flowers that I purposely overexposed a bit to see how badly it would bloom. The light, not the flowers. At f1.8, you can see some around the edges, but this is a 200% zoom. The same shot at f4 still has some around the edges, but none at all in the center. Finally, here are a couple of shots of a garden taken with this lens. This one was taken at f1.8, and this one was taken at f8. In conclusion, this is a pretty good lens. I would definitely recommend picking one up on eBay if you happen to find one available, and get whichever adapter you need for whatever camera you use and try it out. Just keep in mind that it's manual focus and if you're not used to that, we'll take some practice to get focus right, but well worth the effort. Thank you and I will see you in the next video.